Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new episode of the X-Button. I am one of your hosts, Alejandro. With me is the sick boy that just had an incident with Petco. Paul, hey, everybody. How's it going? So, Paul, puppy problems, huh? <laughs> I, If y'all can see it in my face, I'm a little sick right now. And um, through some sort of misunderstanding, I had dropped off my dog at about 9 in the morning today. Um, to get his trim and all of the great stuff and um, hours upon hours passed by expecting them to call me at around one o'clock I had to cancel some things plan most of my day around it because of all this and they never called me finally calling them up at like 3 three thirty or something uh, the lady's like oh yeah We've been just, he's chilling here. He's ready for like three hours now. <laughs> and we were supposed to record uh, much earlier than we are because you were waiting for that call. That's what makes it funnier. <laughs> yeah. I was just hanging out, feeling sick, getting things done as best as I could, finishing Shadows of Rose. And uh, man, that just, uh, when I finally told my wife, she was like, I call the cops call the mafia they've kidnapped our dog get him out of there and then finally i told her what had happened she's like i'm done with everyone right now because she's on a shift from like one to six right now of back-to-back -back counseling sessions which is very draining for people that don't know yeah i can um, i can imagine <laughs> you can only really do two or three normally back to back and to avoid going insane uh, she has much more capability of handling that than I can. So yeah, that's the Petco story, and yeah. boy, was that a thing! Oh yeah, wasting <laughs> my time, yeah. all of this. To me, finding it about because I knew that you were waiting for that call, but then seeing from her post on Facebook, I started dying laughing because I couldn't really disconnected it. <laughs> um, secondhand information. That's that's funny that she posted about it because she'll only after the fact tell me that she posted to social media about mm -hmm. something and then I'm like oh boy here we go because there's like a 50 50 shot that she chose violent yes yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, well. so yeah I'm gonna talk like this and potentially just <laughs> not talk anymore randomly during yeah this you're, you're now the one that uh, has, has needs to drink the tea like I was a few times this year so yep I so, could drink a whole pot of this stuff. Yeah, but hey, it's a good thing that even with all that stress, we can escape for a little bit to, or, from all this nonsense because this is the X Button Podcast, our gaming podcast that posts every Thursdays from 2 p.m. onwards, God willing, available on the YouTube channel Escape Gaming as well as most audio services around the world, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the like. You can find the links and the RSS feed at anchor.fm slash escape gaming. If you enjoy our show, give us a like and subscribe. Yeah, we... Push the recording for a day to, to kind of accommodate something that's happening to you personally, and then this yeah. happened. It was like, what, is, what are our chances? But enough of that, Paul. So we're still playing kind of the same game. So have you kept up playing Gotham Knights? I did actually. Yeah. I, um, I, because that situation with Shadows of Rose happened that <laughs> on our group chat, um, and I shut it off and decided to play something. Um, Let's and then it. <laughs> it's funny because I started by playing Modern Warfare 2. I didn't send it to you, but I saved a video of somebody jump scaring me um, because they had like the riot shield on their back. Uh -huh. And I was looking out a window and I turned and they're rushing me with a knife. And I was like, ah! <laughs> and I shot them down. And then I was like, okay, I need to just like go play something else now. <laughs> um, so I just, I turned everything. You were like on a scary off. tilt, like. Dude, I, 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 after after that uh, Shadows of Rose thing, <laughs> I I was terrified. There's something about that like slowly descending madness of an atmosphere in Shadows of Rose that honestly was way creepier than the main Resident Evil Eight uh, ever was. I would say it was scarier than Resident Evil Seven. Um, just about scarier than most other things I allow myself like, to play. Yeah, its scary things are like more extended. Whereas, like, uh, yeah. even though it, it shares the same environment where the scariest moment of the main game happened, it's, like, the thing that unnerves you there, unnerves you more than a... It's a very specific thing, because yeah. anybody who's watched Doctor Who during the mid to late 2000s can tell you that one episode called <laughs> Don't Blink 
Um, Alejandra, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen anything about it, but... Um, I haven't, but then when you started... Because you had mentioned something about Doctor Who, I remember in our chat. Yeah. Uh, there's something that scared you. So when then you started mentioning it, and then I put two and two together, I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this is literally like triggering him in a way that I was not expecting. <laughs> it, it was such a very specific thing because that was the first episode I ever saw. And if you haven't seen that episode for anybody listening, I would highly suggest looking it up because it's a very standalone episode. Who's the doctor? David Tennant. Um, but that's the thing about it is it mostly follows side characters and mm. he's already been captured by whatever it is. So you have no idea who's going to survive, who's going to die, and several characters do. And it's just so unsettling the way it <laughs> happens um, that you always have to be watching these statues and these mannequins line up exactly with it, barely kind of moving a little bit right before your head turns. Oh, it's, the, yellow, the yellow eyes. Mm, the glowing eyes in the <laughs> darkness is makes it even worse and if i hadn't like watched three separate videos watching where each one spawns i think i would have just i don't think i would have been able to finish this game imagine me playing that in halloween <sighs> i i can only imagine the 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 stuff that you had to sit through jumping through each one of those mannequins uh spawning at that segment where you like you think you figured out the one and then two show up and, and then, then a third first, one and then a fourth, then a fourth one fourth because they're just up. showing up there i was like god damn and they show up in such a way that it's like right where you get kind of comfortable with the ones that are in front of you that you're usually backing yourself up into the other one and it normally i realized that because it goes by the the camera's view not roses mm -hmm. so it goes until it walks into view and stops right behind her so you have to like angle mm -hmm. your camera kind of around it to make it work it's really clever yeah. because yeah, otherwise you just die yeah to me what happens when, when i play that section when everything goes dark and then you have to go get the fuse i knew something was following me but i didn't know what it was i didn't turn around i was just running took the fuse and then I turn around and then it pops in there right in the picture that I sent you. That was my first time seeing it. Oh, and then I, I was oh, like, Ooh. Oh. <laughs> I was like, God dang it. And then it's I kind of surprising that it, um, cause I always thought it was based on the noise that it was faster than you. It, so it, I, it, it, I was playing with headphones. So I was hearing it right behind it. I was like, Ooh. and then, and, and then it just becomes a campy thing with like the tiny, yeah. like the toy story four. I call it <laughs> basically yeah um the yeah. doll thing didn't scare me nearly as much it was very like simplistic in a way a little bit annoying uh because they would sometimes see me through an object and I was like ah whatever you suck and then it like disappears after it's done the damage to you so it almost makes that segment easier in retrospect mm -hmm. um and then the mannequins show back up and then it and the giant really mannequins <laughs> Oh man, but but yeah. I didn't find them the, the giant version scary because now I think it was because of the way it was shot and lit with like the green yeah. light that was like it's less scary instead of like the pure total darkness. Yeah, uh, it was the initial um, section. It's like escalating, but in a way of like, all right, we're back to the like creepy adventure style that it's been so far, uh, as opposed to the absolute horror inducing stuff. And um, one of my YouTuber friends watched it and he normally does not get scared. Uh, and he plays in a very well lit room, big like fighting game dude normally. But I could see him, he was getting scared by his wife coming into the room from behind him. And he was like, <laughs> hey <laughs> um and that's just the funniest part when people that are normally can handle things like that start to get unnerved that's when you know you've either done something really great or just gone in a completely different direction than everything else um so to finally step back from the scariness of all that uh the dlc was great and mm -hmm. um I agree what you said, where it kind of takes a little bit to start going because they it starts really bad. Off this thing starts like, really bad. Like you don't really care about the dude that Rose meets with. You don't really understand what's going on, why she really wants to get rid of her powers all that much, um, and the setup for like where you're going to be playing the actual DLC just doesn't feel very. Uh, well created mm -hmm. and then after a while I was like okay no I'm getting into this this is really uh, this is latching on to me for a minute and uh, especially by the time the 
House Benevieto kind of finishes up. Mm-hmm. I was like full on into it. I prepared for some of the plot twists because I had a feeling, but at the same time, it was like welcome ones where mm-hmm. I was like, oh yes, I totally knew it. This is going to be great. And sure enough, ending with such a wild, super powered fight scene. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only spoilers I guess I'll, yeah. I'll give it. But I like and don't like how that final battle play out because I don't, to me personally, I feel I don't want Resident Evil to go all Devil May Cry. That this is yeah. this is kind of like it, it's so funny. Just thinking how the original version of Resident Evil Four that became Devil May Cry was because Kamiya completely went completely wild. Yeah. And when he was designing, they were like, "No, it went really wild." Instead of let's just scrapping and try to reel back, let's just make it its, its own thing. I feel like to me, Resident Evil works when it can be outlandish, but it knows how to tether the line and to try to make it grounded. And if and. Uh, playing this and then replaying the entirety of Village because I had a save halfway through and I wanted to like test the third person mode that you can do if you get the DLC or if you buy the gold edition of the game if you haven't if you haven't bought Resident Evil Village is that uh it Village is the absolute Resident Evil 4 in steroids and you have to have like a stomach of the game being complete lunacy and Heisenberg with like being all Magneto the uh fish guy that then turns into like that weird leviathan obviously husband of Viento with the um uh be, be, being in the dollhouse and being like this invisible yeah. invisible uh ventriloquist that can like create hall- hallucinations to, to 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 make the doll feel like it's alive even if it's not and then obviously like the lady Casual d Demetres- uh, uh, yeah. lady d 9.2 vampire that um, and her and her and her three daughters. It's just like it's, in, it's fun. Like I would say that there's a, some fun to have how outlandish it can get. It's just not it. Just when I compare it to like Resident Evil Four, that it can get that game can get real campy at times. But I feel like it knew when to be campy enough and when to like be like terrifying enough. And and then I feel that this one is. It reminded me because I, I keep telling you that I don't know if I like seven or eight better. Sometimes like it. It ships, it ships around my head. I'll say this. I enjoy Village as the third-person game more than I do playing uh, Resident Evil 7. Because this uh, this reinforced, like, playing Shadows of Rose and playing this reinforced to me that Resident Evil is just more at home with third-person. Yeah. Even, like, the combat to me, like, playing the Ethan, now playing Ethan in third-person, I think I enjoy much more uh, the combat because when I play it in first-person, I don't think the shooting feels good. Because I think of it as a shooter and there's, like, a certain level of like lagginess and not quite tightness in how you aim especially with the lichens that love dodging mm-hmm. uh often that to me i just never enjoyed the combat there but while you're in third person kind of like uh with modern warfare when you play in third person you do like this the small the, the yeah. small aim that stops right in the shoulder it gives you more room to see and move and not ha- and, and i feel like you have to compensate too much with your aiming i was getting more headshots in Without much use of the aim assist in third person, I was like, yes. And to me, like this felt like a demo for Resident Evil 4 remake that's coming out uh, in a couple months now. Makes a lot of sense as to why they sunk so many resources into it. Um, it gives them the ability to dial in uh, the efforts with Resident Evil 4. Yeah, and especially because 4 needs to be more of a shooter because the thing with 2 and 3 remake, because they has the zombies, the one thing that's very annoying about it is like, but. but Annoying when, if when you think about it more in action terms, is the fact that so many zombies there require so many bullets to down. And they can still come back halfway mm-hmm. through the game, and it's it's so much more in your benefit to take them with like one shot in the head or one shot in the leg, and then mm-hmm. keep running. Um, and after a while, it almost gets frustrating because you're like, God, just all right, get out of my way. Exactly. <laughs> I gotta go get but but that's the thing. Like if if you shift your mindset into playing those games more action-y, the, uh, the, the bullet sponge, uh, sponginess of their faces when you're like shooting them in the head just gets very annoying because it's like, yeah. is he dead now? And and I think that's the one thing that Village has that you know an enemy is dead because every enemy there gives you something all the yeah. time, whether it's like points, sometimes herbs, anything. So And they can go they down totally quicker. Too. Yeah, or they oh, dissolve, yes. Helps. And, in two, and, and in two and three, they don't. Four is more has always been more actiony. It's definitely it, there's tension in that game, but they needed to make it more actiony, and I and I feel like Village is finally giving us a taste of how that's gonna play. Because even four 
if you look if you look at the showcase they showed they did two weeks ago you can see leon crouching something you couldn't do and you crouch in village and it's the exact same animation that i was like yep this is basically testing the waters that's why they implemented this way later than when this game originally came out so uh, but yeah, Shadows of Rose, I ended up really liking it, especially for the price, I thought it was fine, especially because it gave me the chance to play through Village again. Again, that, had, that game that, to me, it just kept getting worse and worse the more I played it, but then I was like, eh, I don't know about finding this, like, Dark Angel, Miranda, and, and near the end, and obviously, I feel, in at least in the Shadows of Rose, you're at least in an equal playing field with the superpowers yeah, and all I, that. So I, I don't want to spoil too much about it, but I got really excited when you could kind of use those superpowers mm -hmm. a little bit more um, with like your teleportation, the, kind of Dragon Ball Zing your mm -hmm. way out of situations. I was like, oh, that's fun. I yeah. hope we get this. Cause like, um, just to kind of segue out of it is like, um, I feel like I haven't seen something like this since Fear, where you merge superpowers with like a really grounded shooting mm -hmm. um with like that horror aspect of it where it's like you're either got this really grounded but also realistic shooter or you got the really crazy superpower side of it there's not really that blend anymore and this was the first time where i felt like oh okay this is cool because it's like i can s i like pictured the series continuing with rose as the main character where it's like she gets dropped into different really terrifying horror horrific places mm -hmm. but she gets better with her powers so she can incorporate that and the shooting side by side yeah. and it just kind of reminded me of how like that, that was kind of cool back in the day during those 360 eras you yes know? i'm just scared because i know how far they jumped the shark when they went to resident evil 6 and that's when they introduced a character that was basically with superpowers with jake wesker yeah and uh and i feel like uh capcom has been really great at at least uh refinding and re-encountering the identity of resident evil when they switched to resident evil 7 went back to the remix and all that like re-establishing the series as a survival horror thing after they completely took the action route of four that knew had to be actiony enough while still giving tension and then five just becoming more of a shooter and even six that i'm afraid that giving you too much power makes the series more of a shooter instead of the survival horror that's kind of like what i'm afraid of i would like to for them to find a way for them to not lose the level of tension because that's what resident evil is so i'm always like apehensive about that direction but we'll see whenever resident evil 9 is announced it probably I one think or, that's one valid or two for years. sure, and I think that they've also struck gold by those House Benevieto kind of situations where it's like, all right, you're powerful enough, we're going to make something tailor-made to like bring you back down to earth to remind you mm -hmm. what kind of genre you're An playing. entire section where you have nothing. <laughs> yeah, so. either that or just something to nullify the powers. I think there's ways to make that happen, but I mean, just look at Fear. They made three games and maybe only the third one felt too much like a shooter. Um, but managed to balance the concept yeah, of stopping but, uh, but, time. But, it but was they terrifying. were they, they were always pitched as shooters. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, Resident Evil no, wasn't. So it's yeah, it's not like a one to one recreation. But that was just the only one that I could really think of that kind of blended those two more than anything else that at least succeeded. Yeah, and we yeah. haven't had a fear in eleven years. Can you believe that? Gosh, so, right. uh, I could see them. And then, like, because before you got sidetracked, because we were talking, we immediately jumped into Resident you, Evil talk. Uh, how so much? We just got that out of the way. <laughs> yeah. So with Gotham Knights, uh, how much farther have you gone in? Like, what was the last thing you remember playing? Did Not you just see? much, but I did the final mission for Harley Quinn. Okay. Um. So you that fight was her? really good. Yeah. Where you like fight her? That. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that was a lot of fun. I played that as Robin, which was really cool. Um, I did it as Nightwing. It, nice mm -hmm. uh i i felt like there's certain characters that pu push that suspension of disbelief better with like evading and like that kind of back and forth dodging mm -hmm. and hitting something like uh red hood doesn't look very good when he's trying to like kind of slide kind mm -hmm. of like do a little shimmy to dodge but some like nightwing um or robin have a much more acrobatic feel to their moves so it just felt like this big cinematic batman origin style boss mm -hmm. fight with uh deathstroke and that was just like i'm so happy this is great uh, this is entertaining um well these guys yeah. made that fight that's what's funny not rock city so perfect <laughs> sense um so yeah i i enjoyed it but also i feel my steam kind of lessening on it because not as many crimes are showing up 
there's, there's not as much to do. Um, so I just got to like go through nights quicker. So and, how uh, it works is that if you don't see the crimes happening, you just find the upside down triangles that you, that you find when you press the D-pad down. Yeah. And do as many of those as you can, just like beating random criminals, because it's gonna keep filling up your meter. You can fill that meter up all right. the way till and then twelve. At the end of the night, it like refines yeah. the cr crimes and stuff. And then for the yeah. next night, there will be those crimes that you can go in, and that's th those are the ones that give you the loot. If you're not constantly doing right. that, you're not gonna be gearing up, especially if you're constantly switching characters. That's a yeah. that that that's kind of like one problem that this game has that. It definitely feels like it was designed for you to like pick that one character to stick with it. Yeah, and which makes me feel bad because I keep wanting to jump between all of them because mm -hmm. I love them all so much. And, and it's I easy to switch when you're in the Belfry. You just go right. to the to the closet and then switch characters. Yeah, um, and it's it just makes it uh, it feels weird because it almost like gives you a, a second win to play as a different character because mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, this is this all plays completely differently. So it almost it doesn't feel like you've been doing the same thing and for five people hours. are and, and 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 from what i've been seeing online for people that are playing it that actually dollar montreal did a good job that if you play each like any of the main missions with or any of the four characters they were written in such a way that you're feeling like you're playing their story yeah. instead instead of feeling like you're playing with like the wrong character it feels like it it was i understand why it's taking a little bit too long because they basically had to make four versions of the game Yep. You know, because for for that for that to really feel like it fits, because I played as night like I did the majority of the main missions of night. There are only eight missions, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah, main main missions and uh, and in, and in those main missions, as I played through Nightwing, it felt like I was playing a Nightwing story that tailored itself really well to to who Nightwing is as a character. And I've yeah. now seen online of people say, "Man, this." This feels like a really great Batgirl story, or others, or others saying, "No, it feels like a really great Robin story." And others are like, "No, what are you talking about? It definitely feels like a Red Hood story." So, I think at least in the writing side, ignoring some of the cringy moments in, in the writing, I think those elements work really well. And the pathos that you can find from so many of the individual characterizations you find in the cutscenes from like the you find it's like that side activity that you can that says that continue playing the game to get more of that and then you just keep getting the little cutscenes so great yeah i like really define the character especially the one that i got with uh, jason todd and uh and alfred that ended up with both of them hugging each other and i had a tear in my eye because it was like just imagine thinking because just knowing the like knowing the story of jason todd and understanding kind of like what his uh, struggle is the cameo yes cameo yeah so knowing what jason's tr uh, jason's struggle is, especially the way they made him such a bulky brute yeah and seeing that he has so many like emotional moments that you wouldn't expect from him you would expect him to be more like a damian wayne style like snark snark tank yeah. but those like but those uh tiny cutscenes like humanizes him in such a way that then he is the heart the heart of the group yeah and especially his final, his very final, final cutscene of him feeling like he can just really chill with his group while just while they're cooking. I'm like, I like this. I, I like this inter uh, inter dynamics between the family. And and I'll say this like the ending. I don't want to really spoil it, but it both. I like that it stays true to the vision of this game, even if it threatens to feel like it's chickening out. But they commit to the thesis of what this game is, and 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 at least establish at least in this universe, the the Gotham Knights as the true defenders of Gotham. So, with the, with the whole Batman die and all that, it's like they don't walk it back. Thankfully, so at least from a from a story perspective, I really enjoyed it. I will say there's some weird design elements that's happening with the leveling system that happens with this game, because the more you level up, because it has a level cap to level 30. The more you level up, enemies in the world also level up, and then they start becoming incredibly spongy. Even even with really good gear, uh, that, that it's it stops being fun just doing random crimes or even some of the uh, even some of the pre predetermined crimes because your character won't feel as strong. But then when you play them in the normal missions, you'll cream them like like Rush so easy, enemies. and it feels really nice. So I would say that if you're feeling like you're getting uh, 
you're getting curb stomped uh, if you're leveling up too much and then the, the enemies outside of there in Gotham City are feeling, are feeling a little too strong, put it on easy. I, I tested it on easy, I was like, okay, this feels like what I would want out of like the DPS of you, what you do to the enemies, considering the level that I am. But normal is there if you want that difficulty. But then when you're you're going to the main missions, I put it back in normal because that scales well. Enemies are scaled at a specific level. Like the highest level the main missions go is 28. So if you get to like level 30, you'll, you'll at least be two levels above. So, And the last mission has a little bit of Valkyrie Elysium uh, energy of way too many ground enemies as you go through that final mission, so just be aware of that, but I, I really enjoy the game. I say I, I put it on Twitter, I get like a... I personally think this is like a 7, 7.5 game, and carry it a lot by its story and how much I love the way they made the characters, and and I feel like I really would like to eventually go back and just mainline with the other three to see how the story, the entirety of the story from start to finish plays out, if you, if you do one, so... And it's not that long. I tell you, this game is not that long. Even though I put, I put like... 40 hours since because I cleaned everything. Like, With all I usually. The padding? I don't even think they'd have that much padding. I don't know. Um, at least for me, it feels like. Each each night I have something to do with either the crimes or all right you got to do a few of these and usually as long as you're aware of the challenges in the back mm -hmm. of your head you just kind of do those naturally throughout the process yeah um, you have to understand the loop for those to come naturally if you don't understand yeah. the loop you're gonna be like running around like a like a chicken with the head cut off not understanding what you're supposed to do or where to like find the enemies that you have to interrogate to, f to finish some of those challenges. That was probably the one thing that I feel like they could have explained a little better, because I know they showed it, but I still hadn't, when I started the game at least, I didn't understand how you had to scan the enemy to get that, and mm -hmm. it was sometimes at certain places, sometimes it wouldn't be others. Mm -hmm. Had to be different regions of the map, mm -hmm. and I was like, golly. Yeah, like, the, fr the freaks are at the north, so find the lower triangles with the purple. And even after doing that the first time, I didn't feel like I had to ever do something that convoluted again. So it's like well, that was such a weird thing to just put right at the front of the game. Mm -hmm. It's not a and it's not a good first that, impression. It's not a good first much impression. Much more straightforward. Um so yeah, uh, overall enjoying myself, but of course I got a little wrapped up in the other thing that we were going to talk about, which I don't know how much you actually want to talk about Modern Warfare 2, but I'll just um, say with Modern Warfare 2, I am just so distressed how miserable of a time I'm having with this game because uh, it just keeps matching me with the worst maps. When, when I try to do the co-op, it both match made way. It, it, it took too long to match make. It dropped my it dropped my teammates. Uh, enemies started spawning in in in, in weird places, and uh, it's it's a game that I kind of want to like a little bit more than I want to, especially because I know there's some people that are legit liking the multiplayer. And I did try a few modes that I ended up enjoying. I, I did one match of invasion. A little too long that you have to wait until 15 1500 for a, for a match to be done and i do enjoy a, a game like ground war especially if the battlefield style uh, or destiny 2 style control mode that you have to capture the the five the five different spots and try to hold them as you as, as you keep like going through the match because i enjoy i think this game is very solid mechanically but um yeah i don't know there's i'm there's something that's keeping me like it keeps pushing me away from modern warfare 2 in a way that I didn't want it to, especially for a game that's gonna be like this for the next two years. So, I think um, I can see the potential for things that they're gonna add and balance and tweak and whatever for the next year or so that I'm not too worried about that side of it. Um, they changed a lot of the things that I was the most worried about from 2019 to this one. Mm -hmm. And um, overall, I, I'm understanding more the progression system, which is one of my biggest concerns about yeah. it. But it's still not good. That's the thing. This, this I wouldn't say it's, no, it's not. Yeah, this progression is an absolute step back because I, th I think that Modern Warfare 2019 progression had both depth and it was easier to understand. This is a little bit more convoluted. Yeah. Um, it looks I way guess... worse. In, 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 yeah, in yeah, UI. <laughs> certainly looks worse, and it's way too confusing to deal with. I still haven't figured out how you're supposed to save uh, blueprints for your own custom mm. uh, weapons. So it's just, it's not an option uh, that I've seen. So I have to like manually search it. I just point. stuck with my M4 that they gave you when you finished the campaign. That's all the weapon yeah. that I've been using, and 
that oh. doesn't feel that good when I know there's many other options like I could unlock. If the game had a more linear progression, so say if you are level 20, these are the weapons that are gonna unlock like you used to be. Yeah. So, um, and then the fact that you have to un use specific weapons to unlock other ones really kind of rubs me the wrong way still even though it's like that's been my mo is to just constantly force myself to keep playing with different weapons so it always feels like i'm doing something different mm -hmm. which was like all right that's kind of what i'm doing already so it kind of works out and i think that's what they were trying to force people to do instead of hey we're gonna give you 60 plus levels of the m4 keep using that one gun all mm -hmm. the time it's like no we want you to keep using different weapons unfortunately uh, there, some are way better than others uh, all I'm going to say with that but it does make me feel better that once I'm forcing myself to play a new weapon as long as I get it to a certain level where it unlocks that level of attachment I already have all the attachments that I really want for it mm -hmm. so then I like not really wasting my time all that much so overall it's like some game types are just way better than others some are really bad some are, maps are really terrible but um, I'm still enjoying it because it fits that one smooth brained area of my brain uh, that, at the end of a day and that's kind of why i kind of want to keep playing because i've been telling you that i have dropped destiny for a little for like a while now yeah and i'm just waiting for like the next season today they released uh this week at bungie that makes me actually very excited to go back in december 9th that's when the new dungeon launches so that i'm pretty oh, that's pretty cool. cool it's gonna launch launch right immediately and uh so i've been wanting to like sometimes i i listen to a lot of podcasts myself and I like play, and and I more recently just want to play more brain dead games to uh, listen to those podcasts because I used to have a bad habit of playing like story based games and still listening to a podcast and then I would I, I would think that I could like process the story while listening to other, others but don't do that people it really like, ruins your experience yeah, even it, if it, you it can, know excuse me what happens it it just jacks up your yeah. whole idea so I I always found like Call of Duty multiplayer like so it's so easily brain dead for me to do that but it just it just annoys me to the point that and after 15 20 minutes i just want to shut it off and uh i was just not expecting that i was gonna be so against this modern warfare i was a little bit more thinking yeah i think i'm gonna really enjoy this one coming in uh because it seemingly felt like it was gonna be a better version from the 2019 one that i liked but didn't love but i wish there was a ps5 version of the 2019 one because I don't like installing the other one that I feel gives me a better experience currently, and it takes so many yeah. gigs. And now I'm. You still have to download Warzone with it, don't you? Exactly, that's the problem. And, and that's the big advantage of this one that they made it clear that you can keep the Warzone client deleted if you don't want it. That's good. Even though the game's still, like, right now with co op, the campaign, and the multiplayer all together, it's 100, 116 gigs right now, and that, I bet you, that keeps growing and growing. Oh, you know. So, because they obviously want you to keep deleting the most that you're... They obviously want you to delete the campaign. Yeah, the thing is that there's still the a part of... Yeah. And there's still a part of me that... Because, again, I, we talked about it a week ago or two weeks ago. I talked that I feel like I was taking crazy pills. That so many people were, like, in love with this campaign. Even though I've seen more people be like, No, I think I like but I don't love this campaign. Or I don't think it's... Like, I've, I'm, I'm seeing now the, the, the balance I was expecting more out of how this yeah. campaign went. Even some in the review. Seeing, like... Game Informer giving it a 6.5, the first time they've ever given a Call of Duty game beneath an 8 in all the times that I've followed them. Like, that tells you a lot about yeah, where, thing, where things are with this game. So, But I'll try Warzone, and then after that, I think that's when I'm going to delete this. <laughs> uh, especially because now we're so, so close for our most anticipated game for, of the year, Paul. And without a more, more preamble, press X. For some news. All right, Paul, uh, I technically delayed the recording of this show for, uh, you had a very important, very important thing on Wednesday. Yes. But part of me also wanted to delay this, re this week's recording because the review embargo for God of War Ragnarok was today, this morning. So I was like, in the tradition of our, the, the previous two big games that we did earlier in the year where we did review roundups, I would like to record an episode where we were going to talk about the reviews. So yeah. God of War Ragnar review roundup, and we got the re review uh, score, uh, the, the the aggregate score from both Metacritic and Open Critic, and it landed at a four. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't hear you. <laughs> like it sounds like. You hear me now? Yes. 
Okay, I don't know what happened, but yeah, it was like, I, yeah, you you you, you sounded like a little. I was like, oh, weird. Ninety four. That was yes. what I said. <laughs> so with a Metacritic ninety four and an Open Critic of ninety four, this is officially the second highest highest rated original game from 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 twenty twenty two behind Elden Ring that currently has a ninety six, which started at a ninety seven and then dropped off. To a, to, a, to a 96 the more reviews came in and the pc version is actually at a 94 i think let me check Elden ring pc metacritic and that was yeah 94 so it's tied to it's tied with Elden ring on pc and makes sense because the pc version of Elden ring was the worst version of that game so it was better on console so here's a review roundup from a couple that i grabbed for god of war ragnarok so the first one our favorite chill up skill up he strongly recommends god of war ragnarok so he says god of war ragnarok concludes the epic of kratos and atreus so masterfully that it is not only that it not only stands on its own as an extraordinary experience but it imbues every prior step in that journey with a new timeless significance he doesn't do scores but strong strongly recommends like the has highest recommendation he doesn't do that often yeah he, he does a lot of i recommend this i recommend this uh, my favorite was I recommend Resident Evil Village even if I don't really like it. That's that was his review. <laughs> so is that, it, it was one of his rare ones. So uh, the, the next review, uh, BGC gave it a five out of five, which is the equivalent of a ten out of ten. Uh, by Jordan Midler, he says God of War Ragnarok is an incredibly special game. It's vital in a way few releases are, with captivating performances that carry an amazing story to a jaw-dropping final act. It's a game that achieves everything it sets out to do to the absolute highest standard. Then IGN, uh, IGN reviewer Simon Cardi, uh, who also reviewed uh, Horizon Forbidden West earlier this year and gave it a 9, gave this a 10 out of 10 and says, An enthralling spectacle to behold and an even more exciting one to take the reins off, God of War Ragnarok melts action and adventure together to create a new unforgettable Norse saga. Impeccable writing, pitch perfect performances, knockout action, it is a complete work, it is a complete work of art from top to bottom. Forbes came in, uh, Paul Tassi from Forbes came in slightly lower, but still at a 9.5. He says, uh, God of War Ragnarok is a beautiful moving game, no longer purely centered on a father getting to know his son, but also about vengeance, forgiveness, and attempting to change both prophecy and the people we used to be, both of which proved to be equally difficult. Game Informer also came in with a 9.5, with reviewer Kyle Hillard saying, God of War Ragnarok feels a lot like God of War 2018, which is a compliment considering how fantastic that game is. Sony Santa Monica was right to not break what wasn't broken, and it has expertly continued the story threads that were left hanging from the previous game. Gamescop, GameSpot came in uh, with a slightly also lower with a 9.0, saying Sony Santa Monica, reviewer Tamor Hussein, saying Sony Santa Monica brings back what made the original God of War reboot great and delivers another fantastic story with exceptional writing. Then with a non-score review, I got Gene Park from the Washington Post. Uh, he wrote, uh, God of War Ragnarok improves on its predecessor in every way. It is my favorite story of 2022. It starts slow, but ends with magnificent flourish. It's a rare story that's even better the second time around. And this has the best combat and puzzles the series has ever seen. God of War Ragnarok has finally dethroned The Witcher 3 with the best side quests I've played in an adventure game. The game's coolest fights, most heartfelt stories, and grandest areas are in the side quests. Do not skip them. There's one stretch in Ragnarok that offers a ton of downtime that I think people will, will find slow, like an extended Mary Jane from Spider-Man PS4 sequence. I didn't enjoy the Anger Boda character too. Not if it drags the whole game, but you might notice. So Paul, it's finally happening. It's like we're six days away now. I'm shocked he reviewed like this, on it personally. I thought it was gonna come. I was. I thought it was gonna come in lower. Because of the sentiment around, like how little they were showing it, uh, the sentiment that uh, reviewers were being harsher on on PlayStation exclusives in general this year, that like almost all of them got 88 on Metacritic. Like um, Last of Us Part One 88 right now, uh, Horizon Forbidden West 88, Gran Turismo 7 came in with an 88 and then dropped to an 87. So it was like everyone was like, so it seems like everyone's gonna be a little harsher on the sequels that Sony's putting out. So. We don't think that God of War, and remember, the first time God of War was shown, there was a, that whole, oh yeah, it looks very similar to the first game. And then obviously the yeah, very, yeah, and especially because it's just weaponizing the console wars into like completely disregarding the way 
sequels used to be. <laughs> like iterated, iterated that are definitely going to look like what came before, but better in, in, in most cases. Like, it's rare for us to get a Last of Us to Last of Us Part 2 seven year gap that obviously you're going to see a huge leap compared to a sequel that took four years to make. And, uh, but the fact that it's a 94, open critic, 94 Metacritic, the same exact score as the 2018 one. That to me makes it even more impressive considering there is like reviewers have gotten harsher with with games. Certainly. Um, so, real quick, how much room, well, how much wiggle room is there for any of these existing reviews to change? Like the Metacritic, I know you say can like kind of fluctuate a little bit mm -hmm. once it releases, right? But most of these are set in stone, obviously, because they're from yeah. a specific reviewer, right? Yeah, and this is easier because this is a single player game, so this is not like a review in progress. So we're not seeing we're we're not seeing many like provisional scores that then could potentially change, maybe higher or lower when they finish the game. And also, uh, right now it has 115 recorded reviews, so I think that that takes in the majority of reviewers. And I feel it has a chance to slip maybe one to a 93. Personally, kind of like how God of War 2 eventually slipped down to a 93. Is there any chance of it going up? Who knows? I'd be sure. It, it, it did went up a little bit uh, earlier today. It went to like a 95, and then it dropped back to like a 94. Got so it. it's about it, but it still makes it like in, in original games, it's still the highest rated, the second highest rated game of the year behind Elden Ring, which we know Elden Ring was a complete movement when it came out back in February. So, and I know I think uh, also there's this site called Steve Ivor that has cl that has shown very clear anti bias towards PlayStation in a way that it just becomes so obvious. Like my favorite was uh, the Horizon Forbidden West review that did that Steve Ivor gave a 6.5. Uh, criticizing things that the same reviewer with Horizon Zero Dawn five years before praised. Like, like criticizing it as a new, like if it was like a new thing to criticize and him like really loving it back back then that it, that it made it clear that it was it was a reviewer with a clear agenda to just like knock down the knock down the scores since Metacritic started getting it. So I don't see that that Steve Iver has has a review for this. So they probably didn't didn't send them the review. So I can imagine since Metacritic uh, like records their reviews now, uh, eventually they're going to get the game, they're going to review it, they're probably going to score it low, and that could probably bring it down like in, in, in a bad faith way. But I still say like just the fact that it debuted at a 94 right now, the same way as a game from like uh, four years ago, in, in, in an environment that's a more harsher, it's actually pretty pretty impressive. Some of the things I mentioned here, I do have a little bit of concern. I've been hearing that the game has a really slow start, so I'm like, hmm. I remember the first one also had a little bit of a slow start. I know this game yeah. is technically a little lower, uh, slower. I wasn't going to worry too much about that side of it because mm -hmm. I remember how slow the, the first one began, but that was like sort of the point, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, especially with when you build to such crazy monumental nonsense, you almost want to look back once you've reached the metaphorical peak mm -hmm. and you say, wow, we really started with cutting a tree down yeah. and starting a funeral. And now we're freaking beaten up. Uh, the world serpent is eating the head off of a corpse uh. giant being powered by Freya, the goddess of the mm -hmm. Norse pantheon. It was like, you just, that's all the crazy nonsense, obviously, from 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so I could see how this would be the same system. Um, yeah. Of course, Lo oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And uh, and especially like Jim Park from Washington Post specifically mentions deeper in yeah. his review that especially more in Ragnarok, these slower parts even make more sense because this game introduces more characters that are more intrinsically tied to the story that this is just not a, a Kratos and Atreus, and Atreus story anymore. Yeah. And that makes me more excited to see how... Because, and they say this game is still a one-shot camera thing. So I want, I want to see how they still like weave all those characters in in a way that continues the play-like style of storytelling for uh, that God of War introduced in 2018 where, you know, like in a play, you follow a few characters and you have things come in and out into your scenario, like in specific moments, and then they leave and then you just keep going because it keeps things focused. I want to see how that, like, how that improves. And people just keep saying that the story of this one is just better. Like, you, it, like and that to me is like insane to think about. Uh, but I can also imagine, because I always said that uh, in plot, the 2018 one wasn't that great. In character study, the 2018 one was great. It's and in its simplicity. Yeah. Not plot 
focus. I mean, that's what uh, my problem used to be with it for so long because the whole main game felt like it created its own side quests out of it. Mm -hmm. Where it was like, all right, we want to get to this thing. Oh, we went to the wrong mountain. Oh, we got to get to this thing. Kratos destroyed the portal. Oh, mm -hmm. we got to get to... Th it's like they kept like making its own problems where this one, I feel like it's building itself almost the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, but then to equally do that much uh, character stuff. I wanted to mention the uh, specific mention to Witcher 3 side quests, which mm -hmm. as most that people... That to me popped my popped my eyes. Uh, Gene specifically saying that because uh, if a game is defined by a side quest, what's The Witcher Three? Yes, and uh, yeah, for anybody that doesn't know, obviously The Witcher Three is famous for very very good side quests, uh, outclassing its main plot line uh, in some areas by far, and uh, nothing has ever come close to that. People not even Cyberpunk cyberpunk but it wasn't yeah they tried and there were a few that were pretty good um but i wouldn't say it reached the witcher 3 status so somebody that was acknowledging that uh they were going to be passing the crown over to god of war ragnarok yeah. makes me curious and then the q a that we're not going to read here because i'm going to respect a little bit of the privacy where i got that q a because it's in a private discord the guy mentioning that a lot of the best part are like in side quests that happens post game and have made him emotional. I was like, oh man, that's that, that made me curious, yeah, um, and a little nervous. But some in, like, Red Dead Redemption, movie. Jack Marston thing. I Most am that's my theory, that's your theory. Let's see how it yeah. plays out. But, um, gosh, it's like it makes me want to rush through the story of the game, but I also really don't want to rush through, yeah. um just so i could talk about it but then also to be like oh, i want to sit yeah. with this as long as i can you know i tell you it's like it's me waiting for these reviews and seeing it just to see if it would land around the same place in in in, in like excitement with the critical community and uh me realize because the, the, i woke up early this morning i look at the hours like when's the review embargo okay crap i was like counting down the hours i remember doing the same thing for uncharted 3 back 11 years ago which by the way happy 11th 11th anniversary uncharted 3 in november 11 2011 that was two days ago we're recording on november 3rd i haven't been this excited for a game like this since like uncharted 3 i didn't even have this excitement for like the god of war 2018 i was like very shocked to see that it reviewed so well coming from ascension i was like okay i guess it's really good let me try it and then we know remember when those reviews happened, I was still in my malaise. I, do I even like games anymore? Remember that? Yep, I so, remember it. so yeah, I haven't had a game that I wasn't this because Elden Ring, like, the only reason why we dove in is because we were not even going to play that game initially, remember? We're like, we have bought already many games. Uh, Seafood is hard. We have an open world with Horizon. Uh, do we really want to do, like, we really want to jump in, right into that? And then the amazing reviews happened. They were like, crap everyone's like crowning it right now i think we gotta try it and then we saw that Elden ring was one of the one of the greatest games of all time even with its problems so but i haven't had a game that i'm like legit excited that now i'm looking at the calendar crap it's six days away i'm like ah oh, what is gonna feel so eternal waiting for it and i'm excited to feel that kind of excitement because it's rare for me to get in this post pandemic era where everything gets delayed that we're so worried that it would Oh yes, I mean it was like I'm traumatized by how everything has been delayed now. So I'm just glad it happened. Release time is like that. Uh, it's Tuesday night because November. this game is actually releasing on a Wednesday because of right. November nine Odin's Day. Yeah. So they they're being very cheeky about it. So. so I'm down for that. Yeah. So now it's like now that the reviews are out, I have to like hold really strong and not going into comment sections. Even though freaking Digital Foundry, because I wanted to read uh, some of the technical, uh, because they usually like I like their break, their technical breakdowns of like what the game's resolution is, how the game is performing, and they do like really deep dives. They explain something that spoiled a part of the game for me. I was like, God damn it, I didn't want to know that. So yeah, I have and to be. I have to yeah. Be way too okay with just saying random things casually. Exactly. You have yeah. One crew that's like does it out of spite and. You just you hate mm -hmm. those people. Yeah, especially because this game got sold early by a a, 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 a store that broke Street Day. Remember, we we're talking about it in our chat that, especially Corey Barlog being like the, the consoles uh, giving out the God of War version instead uh -huh. of another version. It's like this. This. No, that that one was funny. That the PS5 Direct sent someone the God of War bundle that apparently is the disc. 
So that's even worse. So they actually gave them the game, and, and they gave us in the disc, not a digital a digital code. Because I would have understood it a digital digital code. Because even if you punch in, like the game already is programmed in the PSN to not unlock until a certain time. The problem now that it's like even Corey is like, yeah, the Modern Warfare 2 disc has nothing in the disc. Only has a 70 megabyte like key for you to then download the whole game. And I know like this, the physical people are like decrying that the reason many people like still getting physical discs is that the majority of games, at the very least, have the game in the disc so you can put it in. You don't need to download anything. So yeah. that's some good preservation. But then Corey was like, now I'm starting to understand a little bit of the benefit of just maybe just doing a key in, in, the, in, in the disc because they can't trust anyone anymore. Like you were telling me that when you worked at GameStop, when Halo 4 was happening, that... You all treated the the yeah, launch the, of the thing like big orange stickers along the side of it, and it was like "Do not open until like November, whatever that day that that came out." And it was <laughs> like, I I was really close to my store manager. He was like, "Don't you even dare look at that thing," because like no. uh, they, GameStop was really gonna put the hammer down on anybody that like took anything. No. It's so funny. One time I went to a GameStop in Tulsa. Uh, a friend of mine wanted to get an... Uh, he wanted to sell his Xbox One and get the Xbox One S back in 2016 yeah. when, when that was because the Xbox One S was a sweeter looking console than the PCR garbage of that original one. And uh, when we were there, uh, they had the normal white one, but then we met, we asked them, ah, so when are the... Uh, the themed ones launch, like coming out, like the ones with colors, and then one of the store clerks was like, we actually have the Gears of War one back there. And they took it out, and if it was the same price that he, that, that he was going to buy the one, though, because he was going to buy the one with the Battlefield 1 bundle. I don't know if you remember that bundle. So, I remember a lot of them very well. I remember the Gears of War one because my, my roommate had it, and it was mm -hmm. like red and black with that the one. Big uh -huh. Gears logo. It yeah, so... So yeah, because it was going to be the same price as the Battlefield 1 one, they were like, you can get this one. And they were like, yeah, give me that one. And then when they tried to scan it, the computer was like, not available for sale. For sale. So yeah. that even tells you that at least there's some stores that at least have a little bit of contingencies. But I bet this was not a GameStop or anything because they would be like in massive trouble. But yeah. that's the problem is like they carry your game. So like if you penalize them, then they're not going to sell it. It's like... It's unfortunate, but that's another example for why physical is maybe a dying breed. Especially with how everything is being so careless now. Yeah, it's... I I don't really want to spend too much time talking mm -hmm. about it. I'm really torn on the concept because mm -hmm. on one hand, like you said, it's there's a lot of places where you don't have a very stable internet connection and you really rely on the game being on that disc. But even nowadays, uh, the Blu-rays can only handle so much storage data. Mm -hmm. And if the game is bigger than that, you can't put the whole game on that one disc. Um, and Sometimes comes really with two discs, remember? Touch, but a lot of games... Um, at least I feel like uh, we were coming along that side. You bought Red Dead Redemption 2 on disc, right? Yes. Yeah, that <laughs> right came that, that that came with the that was the first game with the two Blu-rays. Yeah. Yeah, to um, install. And sometimes they'll do that. Sometimes they'll put part of the game on the disc and the rest is a download. So if you don't have internet, you can't play the game, even mm -hmm. if you have the disc. So it's like, it's really kind of back and forth, especially during the times that I was selling games myself. Um, and I I don't really know where I fall on it because on one hand, it's way easier to just do download codes, just keys, even through a disc. Um, but then especially for some people like deployment in military and things mm -hmm. like that, they really rely on on that disc so um i can never really endorse full digital yeah. in some ways me neither uh, i like if you, i showed you the prices of things down here yeah. with physical so, like, it's like that you, was the big reason why i moved away said so, and also sharing with my brother and doing like the kind of arrangement that i did with you with our shared right. account to buy the games that's what i had with him when he was more into playstation back in the playstation 4 era we were like wait so if we put the primary account and then someone has a secondary account and we split it then we can both have the game and we've split the prize we're like of course we're gonna do that we're not gonna buy 80 dollar discs here so that's why i made the that, that's why i made the switch to digital but uh part of me understand i do i did like back in back in the day especially during the 360 era this were plug and play and that was it no installs then we moved to blu-rays and then like ps3 was blu-ray so that was the 
big disadvantage with getting sometimes third party games versus on 360 that you needed to get the install and sometimes that didn't even help with loading a few times it did but but yes like i that's one big advantage of why some people still buy a physical for switch putting in those cartridges in just start playing immediately so at least there's there's more value there and uh i do i do wonder if this is not the, the inflection point uh, halo infinite didn't have the game on the disc that was one of the first big ones that were like what the heck why is this not here no and uh, it only had the multiplayer you had to download the campaign because that came later so they only they only cooked in the multiplayer and even then if you want to play the multiplayer you have to patch it in so because it's always online That's nature winnable situation exactly and then modern warfare uh, it was funny jim park uh, he's a big physical guy Jim Park, when he saw that with the Modern Warfare thing, he was like, you know what? Maybe uh, Activision and Microsoft really deserve each other because they're the ones that are pushing the old digital and trying to screw this. That's one big thing that some people really like about PlayStation, that their disc games, at the very least, they're all inside the disc. At least there's a base playable there. But right. this God of War situation, I wonder if that's going to change stuff. But enough of all the God of War talk, Paul, because... Definitely by the time we record next week, we will probably have played it, so I can't wait. That's exciting. Ooh. Yeah, ooh, it's uh, it, it feels excited to have a game that I'm really excited about for the fall. I haven't had one, a game like that since Death Stranding, so... Gee, yeah, I am into that. All right, let's get into this. What yes, we got? so... Staying with... In, in a little bit of Sony news, uh, they revealed this... Was it a day or two ago? Like, very early in the morning, so... Yeah, it was like a day or two ago. Yeah, me. so... Story number two uh, from Game Informer's Marcus Stewart. Sony reveals PlayStation 2 VR 2, uh, sorry, PlayStation VR 2 release date, price, bundle, and new games. Sony announced that P PlayStation VR 2 will launch on February 22nd and has revealed its price, two bundles, as well as accessories and newly announced games. The standard package would retail at $549.99. It includes the headset two PSVR 2 Sense controllers, and stereo headphones. And uh, if you want something to play out of the box, the PlayStation VR 2 Horizon Call of the Mountain bundle has you covered. This edition runs for... $600. <laughs> and tosses in a digital call for the first person Horizon spin-off on top of everything that comes in the standard package. Want to charge your controllers without using up your PS5's USB ports? Feast your eyes on the PlayStation VR 2 Sense controller charging station for... Uh, $50. <laughs> yeah. Sony states that pre-orders go live on November 15. During the launch phase, the only place to pre-order will be through the online store at direct.playstation.com. Good luck with that. For the US, UK, France, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. You can register to pre-order beginning today. And orders made through the online store will be shipped during launch week. <laughs> that sounds ominous. Why don't you say launch day? Uh, meanwhile, customers in other markets will have to reserve PSVR 2 at local, uh, local retailers. So, have fun with that, game, game, game stop. Uh, in, a, in addition, 11 new PSVR 2 titles have been unveiled. You can read about each one in detail on the PlayStation blog, but here's a brief description of each and their release windows. After the fall, a post-apocalyptic co-op shooter by the studio behind Arizona Sunshine. See this VR Enhanced Edition, an improved version of the VR edition of City Skylines. Cosmonius High, restore an alien high school in this wacky adventure title from the makers of Job Simulator 2023. Crossfire Sierra Squad, a new VR first-person shooter uh, from the Crossfire franchise. Remember that amazing Crossfire X game? Hey, believe me. I yeah. <laughs> the Dark Picture Switchback VR, a roller coaster VR horror action shooter by Supermassive Games. Remember Until Dawn, Rush of Blood? This is basically that. Uh, Hello Neighbor, Search and Rescue, team with friends to free a captive friend in this, in this VR take on Hello Neighbor. Jurassic World Aftermath Collection, an enhanced bundle of parts 1 and 2 of the Jurassic Park survival action game. The Light Brigade, a roguelite first-person shooter with procedurally, procedurally generated levels. And Pistol Whip, the acclaimed rhythm action game is enhanced for PSVR 2 and will be a free upgrade to existing owners. That's, not, that's actually nice to know. Tentacular, sold in physics-based puzzles as giant adorable kraken. And Zenith The Last City, a VR MMO RPG. As a reminder, PlayStation VR 2 is not backwards compatible with original PSVR games, hence why some PSVR titles are getting new enhanced ports. We went hands-on with PSVR in September, you can read our comprehensive impressions of the text, some of its titles, including Horizon, Call of the Mountain, and Resident Evil Village in at Game Informer. Alright, alright. 
So are, Paul, are y'all kidding me right now? Yeah, this oh. is DOA. <laughs> oh my gosh, the fact. Oh, it's like no, it's a no-brainer. You have to if you if this. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here no. in my own head. Um, okay, let me let me bring it down here for no. us. Um, when you're doing something like this, this is like the luxury level of gaming in itself, much more so the fact that so a lot of people consider gaming in general mm-hmm. a luxury. Um, so you're going to have to spend this much money to get this whole setup. And you're not even going to be able to play anything that was already mm-hmm. going on out there. You have to buy a new version of it. Um, that's just... The, probably yeah. the worst part of this, I think. Yeah, the fact that the fact that um, now if you had any game that was on PSVR one to be playable here, they have to make an enhanced port, and yeah. they will decide if they're gonna do a free upgrade or it's gonna be a paid upgrade with Sony. You know, it's like a wild card. Some people like charging you others. There's no smart delivery like an Xbox that guarantees you the free upgrade. And uh, think about it this way, Paul: How much is the disc version of the PS Five? Five hundred. So this base, like just machine, is more expensive than your console. And on top of that, if you want it with like the game, the Horizon Call of the Mountain, that's been the big game that they've always been like showcasing this thing, is at the price of the PS3. <laughs> I yeah, can't re- believe that. That, that, uh, that picture I sent you of someone saying 549, putting Jim, Jim Ryan's picture in it, is what I tell you. It's like Sony right now, it's in such a greedy stage of their business that I'm... And some people are trying to justify this as like, no, there's like actual legit cool, like high end technology inside the VR compared to the PSVR one. That's why that one uh, retail at 399. And then if you and that was just the headset, if you wanted the camera, if you wanted the two move controllers, it was 499. And uh, this is just the one option that gives you that. So basically, this is not going to be like PSVR uh, one where you could just get the headset and you can still play a bunch of games just with your DualShock. Because you didn't need like move controllers, so it's like that already limits the uh, the versatility of what you can do with this machine. So it means that you always need to do the new move controllers that look like um, uh, at Tron Legacy spheres. Yeah. I don't know, like, which yeah, that that works actually. <laughs> yeah, it it's like it it's like it's kind of a cool aesthetic, but it's still a little too showy. But I just can't get over the price, and especially like some people are also trying to justify like compared to the MetaQuest Pro that's like one thousand four hundred dollars. Or the HTC Vive that's like a thousand three hundred, uh, five hundred forty nine is like a really good value, and I'm like, mm, I, aren't the a... like the Vive and the Meta whatever uh, the Meta Quest those play They're... like PC games, don't they? Mm-hmm. So it's like you're not even, it's it's apples and oranges on this one. Like you just you can't really compare those situations because, because they those... have a bigger library already. A lot of those things are already compatible because that was already like universally made. Sony decided to be so cheap early on that they used PS3 move controllers for like for for like their tracking. So <laughs> I mean, I from a business standpoint, that was genius because then you could reuse all the old assets that you were losing money no, on. No, not but only that, they, they reused a bunch of moves that they never sold because the exactly. move was a catastrophic failure. I bet you had a bunch of PS move. Remember oh, the big, the, so the, many. The, 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 bond, the Killson 3 and we Resistance 3 bundle. Too. Uh, I almost bought one. I almost like, brought one through like something called Aero Casillas, which is like oh, a, a shipping thing because I was like, I kind of want, because I did, I did have a P, uh, move. My dad bought me one. Uh, he bought a used one and I played the tennis game. It was actually pretty cool. And I did a uh, kill some three with move. It played really well. It was, it was like a very version of playing a first person shooter on Wii. Yeah. It was like, if I found gimmick, but not like the ideal way to play it, but it worked. Yeah. But that it was a fail that the move was a failure like an abject failure and psvr allowed them to have all those warehouses of moves the fact that they even had the usb you could even charge with the usb with the ps4 controller you need to find that old one that had like the little triangular angle to to, go, to come so in. hard to describe uh-huh. because the the titling because as you know you have to make a sticker title for yeah. everything usb the, like the usb c right now in, yeah it was so hard to like type that into the system for it to find even if you had any much less where you would find uh-huh. them uh it, w- it was a freaking wild and west, here's the worst and that. the worst part the move controllers didn't come with those cables like they didn't at all like oh 
no. Yeah, they, they yeah. didn't. They didn't come with those cables because Especially they were pre-owned because they were just the thing with a sticker on them in yeah. like a bag sometimes. Yeah, but even new, they didn't come with the cable because the Gosh. idea was that why were would we give you a cable with a move? You already have one with the one that we give you yeah, with every which, PS3. That's what they do now so, with the uh, the controllers anyway, though, right? Like, yeah, they don't. They don't give you a cable because they they anticipate you're gonna have the cable that comes with the right, like with or the console, the, yeah. like standing charge yeah. port, like this one, like the USB C right. that comes in with the PS5 controller. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like how they justified about it. And that one was even even extra stranger because it was like, wow, you're not gonna give a cable for like generational country like controllers yeah. so so at least at the very least i guess there's some high tech there but i think it's a little presum presumptuous and pretentious to think that this is going to be successful especially like that launch lineup like it's, the freak it, yeah. it's I... like that's bad that's a very bad selection of games to try to like be like i'm gonna be there day one like i think no. um I think it was Alana Pierce that saw said it on her um, either her channel or her podcast, whichever, saying that she's finally accepted the fact that VR is just not going to be a household thing across the board. It's just mm -hmm. it whether or not it's compatible with the current economy, it's just not something that some people can even biologically handle, mm -hmm. much less afford. So it's like it's always going to be niche because we've realized now that you can't just throw your your grandmother at vr and expect no. it to have the same result as you're gonna give them an aneurysm if you put them in gonna, vr like, <laughs> look at all the videos of the people on that one um thing where they just they're standing there and they just fall over or yeah. they get spooked by something and then they break something falling how about the one of punching the tv is those are my favorites oh. um and that that always hurts my soul because i know how much those tvs how much cost oh, and no. because it's like once if you break the screen of those tvs it's over it's there's over, no yeah. way there's no way to like repair it it's gonna be so catastrophically expensive that you might as well just buy a new tv yeah so so anyway it's just this is not where they need to go for that they need to go for something more low cost get rid of some of the bells and whistles on this this can exist maybe later on when you have the resources for it but when you're mm -hmm. also struggling to find semiconductors for your main system maybe which can be found now finally which, it's finally, in the, 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 yes. the ps5 is finally in stores pictures of them mm -hmm. um so yeah, they're finally showing up but it's like don't jump yourself into this problem now making the assembly line of all these that you now feel like you have to sell because you're obviously selling them at a loss again yeah and what's funny is that they had mentioned that they had already manufactured two million of those when everyone like when they said that i was like okay so i guess they're feeling very confident that they have a mass market price that in this economy they're gonna like absolutely adopt that so everyone when they said that they, they thought this at least will be 399 maybe at the worst in, in the worst case scenario 499 yeah like at now least two ma really and they, they, this already went beyond and i think you know what i also believe um this also proves kind of like the whole inflationary thing of how they're like bumping prices because 549.99 is the price of the fat of the disc ps5 outside the us mm. and again because remember the us was yeah. the only one that they didn't want to uh, like like uh like hike the price so and if you introduce it at this price it's not like you're raising the price after the fact because they're just getting ahead of it uh-huh which i can see it it's still just not not a good look and no. not a good effect either and not to mention the final thing that i'll say is now there are vr headsets that can do all this wirelessly and this cannot this. And that is the final nail in the coffin for this sucker because I have done it with the cable. You, it just messes with you. It pulls on you. You mm -hmm. get caught. You get tangled up. Yeah. It's like even though they say that um, they, they have been trying to push the PSVR two with the whole um, because it has such this high tech, yeah. and we're simplifying the way that we're connecting the VR to the PlayStation console because the if, try to find a setup of how you needed to connect the PSVR one that had its. Uh, it's processing box with like the two sets of cables coming from one side to the other that looked so ugly and there was like no way to properly arrange it in a way that just didn't make uh, cables crisscross that they were like no this only has one cable but still meta which i will never carry water for them at least in the base uh in, in the base model like they have a base model that's completely wireless and when you do wireless people tell you it's like it's over yeah 
Like, there's no way to... Um... Convenience outdoes performance every day. Mm -hmm. uh, for the general public, at least. Yeah. So it's like, they need to go lower tech and make that wireless for it to be successful. And then maybe give you the pro version with the wired and the mm -hmm. extra stuff. It's just, it's not the right method. But I'll give it to them. They're ambitious. Mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Sony being ambitious... Uh can sometimes be good but sometimes like can be really bad and um and, and to me it's like what's sad is that i have always thought of vr as, as like our next uh horizon like kind of like the next horizon of gaming not the not, not the franchise but kind of like gaming's new horizon like what's the next evolution for we've got like i feel we have reached as far as we can get with like consoles that this is probably like the best next way to games to evolve and with these kind of prices this early on especially where we're in the economy it's just br is just going to remain that niche thing and i feel like it's just going to keep stunting us into a cycle that where the only evolutions that we're going to keep seeing of games is like better graphics better frame rate and all that and eventually that's fine but then yeah remember like if, how exciting it was to get the leaps from the uh, when we went from sprites to the 2D art styles, to 3D and analog sticks and rumble, eventually motion controls. It, it just sucks that I don't want to live in a world where we feel like gaming has already peaked because with no more innovation can happen. So sad for VR, especially because this would have been the affordable one, but let's see how it sells. Let's see if uh, the 2 million that Sony has produced are going to be the lifetime. <laughs> so story number three, Paul, this one was a interesting story because it just feels so messy and didn't uh, engender enough confidence in this like conglomerate for me so by charles hart for also from game informer embracer group shuts down square enix montreal studio just months after acquiring it according to a, a bloomberg report by jason schreier video game publisher embracer has shut down onoma the studio formerly known as Square Enix Montreal, just months after its acquisition. Some staff will be transferred to Eidos Montreal, another studio owned by Embracer. This news comes just a few weeks after Onoma underwent a rebranding process, where it adopted the new name. So let's just stop right there, Paul. Not easy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I... Two, I weeks, so, two weeks ago, we were like, yeah, we got a new brand. Let's go. <laughs> we're closing These shop. These companies that are selling out to publishers need to like put some kind of clause in their contract that says, hey, we can't immediately get shut down, please. Mm -hmm. um, because this is just keeps happening. Mm -hmm. they, they're like, all right, we're so excited to be entering this new partnership with this mega corporation. I can't wait to see all the great things we can make. Oh, uh, we're getting shut down now. Oh, well, uh, that sucks. Yeah, because apparently they were going, uh, they, they mentioned that uh, Embracer Group is shifting away from like mobile development into just console quality and PC titles. Which I can respect, but at the same time, yeah. shady. Yeah, but, but and, and then like just to continue real quick, so Onoma was best known for its work on the Go series, turn based spin-offs as popular items interactive titles designed for mobile. This includes Hitman Go, Lara Croft Go, and Deus Ex Go. Their most recent work was Tomb Raider Reloaded, which came to mobile devices earlier this year, and their future plans involved the title based on Avatar The Last Airbender. So this was these guys. Remember when we saw like a mobile guy a, a yeah. mobile game for Avatar? So that's gone. <laughs> well, I mean, I uh, I was still freaking I was all mad about the whole process at mm -hmm. the time, and now I'm like, well, shoot, I guess uh, that got shut down. Who, who would have expected that to happen? Yeah. Um, and that, that isn't even really that much uh, sarcasm either. It's just like, oh, wow. They, I mean, they were putting a lot of work into that. They were going to uh, work with the creators and mm -hmm. stuff to make something. And But also, th I also think about this, um, because... This Onoma team that used to be Square Enix uh, Montreal and Eidos Montreal and Crystal Dynamics like Embracer bought from Square Enix for three hundred uh, million dollars, which was like so so cheap compared to like the prices so many studios are going these days in the billions. That how much of like how 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 easy it is to just completely uh, write off like if we if we're like, just think about it this way it's a uh, did they just completely write off a hundred million dollars, like an acquisition, or where square, or, or or could you like 
be like the only way that I could logically rationalize is that in those 300 million dollars, 150 million each was for Eidos Montreal and Crystal Dynamics, and they just kind of gave uh, Onoma as an add-on because what kind of like a professional and economical malpractice it is that you acquired this to just shut it off. That's so, what I'm just. It feels it feels it feels messy, and then combined with the, and and we know that now that Embracer has all these things that they've gobbled up. Remember when we talked about that one night that we we saw that they embraced that they bought things like the Lord of the Rings IP, the uh, Tripwire Interactive limited run games, and a bunch of stuff. Like and I remember it was like just a nightmare of me posting more and more and more press releases that they were announcing so so late at night. And this is how they handle it. Is and now I'm very worried about how they're gonna handle all of this very very worried uh fi finalizing the story it says the bloomberg report also says that the closure is part of a cost-cutting initiative and that idus montreal will help projects scale back and cut as well some of these resources will be redirected to assist in the development of a game in the fable franchise led by playground games so that was also something that jason schreier kind of added just as extra detail of, what, of what's happening with these studios that they have acquired so right now crystal dynamics was already aiding with uh with, with the perfect dark reboot and now uh Eidos montreal is now also helping microsoft over uh over their fable project remember when we were talking many weeks ago about uh matt booty uh, microsoft's matt booty mentioning the the days of the, the days of single studio development without like hey it's it's all over this is continuing that but it's so funny that they're still even with their massive network of studios, they're finding the aids in third parties. That I do find funny with like the Microsoft side. That even though they have like 23 studios, they need to still go out out, out of their own stable to get the resources or like partners that can help with the, with this new reality that you need a lot of people working in the same game and in, in one game to ship it. So and is this delaying us seeing more Crystal Dynamics and Idos Montreal games if they're aiding with this? other products that are taking forever to come out from Microsoft. That to me is kind of sad, but then Jason Schreier mentioned that Eidos also started development on a new Deus Ex and a new IP that they had to rescope. So there's some excitement there. Be like, yeah, can't wait to see Deus Ex back. We haven't seen it since 2016. And uh, in a new IP, let's see if they bring some of the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, systems they established maybe into this new IP and they reuse them. So. It's just interesting. Like to me, that, that this was like a very weird story, very very weird, and uh, just not not engenders goodwill and to embrace her as as a good steward of everything that they own. Yeah, not Be at all. Because it's just that's just insane. You buy something to close it in the same year that you bought it. This so, is not good at all. Yeah, either. even if it's mobile crap. That even though I wouldn't call the Go games crap because a lot of people love Hitman Hitman Go. And a bunch of those things. Shocking. It's still, so yeah I've, yeah, I've actually heard surprisingly good things about it. But um, and it even tied in its mobile stuff with uh, one of the expansions for the mm -hmm. first Hitman reboot, I think. Yeah, it, and to me, it's just worse that they allowed them to rename themselves. Remember how hard it is to get a trademark? Well, some things can be easier. All that or... effort just yeah. to be like <laughs> close two weeks later. <laughs> Oh, so man. my my throat is gonna is slowly yeah. starting to die more, but um, so I might not talk as much for some. Yeah, of I don't think you you're gonna react more to this ones than have too much to say. But uh, let's let's plow through these other ones. Uh, story number four: uh, Electronic Arts deal with Marvel consists of at least three games by Marcus Stewart from Game Informer. Which we knew about some of these. Yeah, right? we knew about we officially knew about one, and then we knew rumors of another one. So. Mm -hmm. When Electronic Arts Motive Studios announced its Iron Man game in September, we learned it would be the first of a multi-game deal between the publisher and Marvel. That was a vaguely defined arrangement at the time, but we now know the partnership will produce a minimum of three titles. EA announced the news in a press release, with the publisher describing it as a long-term deal that could extend beyond three games based on the wording. The release also specifies these titles will be action-adventure games for console and PC, each featuring original stories in the Marvel Universe. It's worth clarifying that EA is not getting exclusive rights to Marvel like it had with Star Wars. There are multiple Marvel games in the works at various studios, including the recently announced Captain America Black Panther game from Amy Hannix, Skylands Media. We can stop there. I feel this is the right way. This should have been the way they should have done Star Wars. Instead of locking 
EA on that Star Wars deal for 10 years. I can't believe that. They should have done that kind of like game, like in a few game per game basis. So to allow, kind of like not how they're doing that now everyone can pitch in. And maybe they can do like individual contracts with different developers to uh, to see how things go. Because locking a 10 year contract into a company that completely mal in, in total malpractice mishandle the Star Wars IP until the very end. With Jedi Fallen Order, but imagine like, having to wait that long. Somehow managing to pull something out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, and, and at least we know we, we know about it. the Iron Man game is confirmed, the Black Panther game, by the source we heard, it's definitely going to be real because even though Jeff Grubb failed us on the Twilight Princess and Wind Waker stuff, when it comes to EA, he hits he hits 100%. Uh, he, stri he, he strikes the balls 100% all the time with them. He knew about Mass Effect Legendary Edition. He knew about the Death Space remake. So he knew about Jedi Survivor, the title, before they officially re re revealed it. So oh. when, when it comes to EA stuff, at least I believe him in that. So I'm excited to see what the third one could be. What would like and uh, who would make it from EA? If it's also going to be Motive, or if it's going to be that new studio that they're building over there in Seattle. So next story, Paul. It's a a double whammy of Kojima news. This one, I'm curious about yeah, this. I love this one. Uh, story number five. Hideo Kojima has addressed the Blue Box Game Studios' abandoned conspiracy. So, oh, abandoned. Uh, very special moment for episode 16 of the X Bottom back in 2021. Shocking. Yeah. I can't believe that stuff happened. Yeah, Hideo Kojima has finally addressed the uh, story by Wesley LeBlanc. Uh, Hideo Kojima has finally addressed the conspiracy theories revolving around him and Blue Box Game Studios abandoned, and in short, it's a nuisance for him, unsurprisingly. Abandoned was announced with a short teaser back in 2021 as a game being developed for PlayStation 5 and PC. Not long after the reveal, speculation that Abandoned was actually a Silent Hill game secretly in development began to ramp up, but studio head Hassan Karman took to Twitter to shut the, down those rumors and adding editorial notes, and absolutely failing constantly at that. Uh, from there, the speculation train arrived at the idea that famed Metal Gear Solid developer Kojima was attached to the game. Some believe that Kojima actually was Karaman, on the basis that both their first names start with H, and both their names start with K. Plus, people thought Blue Box was meant to tie in into BB from that Stranding. There was, there was plenty more speculation attempting to tie Kojima to Bannon, but in the end it was nothing. As of April of this year, Blowbox says Abandoned is not cancelled and is still in development. Throughout all these rumors, Kojima has remained silent on the issue. However, in a new episode of his Spotify podcast, Brain Structure, he, broke, he has broken his silence, calling it a nuisance as reported by Video Games Chronicle. Users just kept sending me pictures of this Hassan, Kojima told Game Awards producer Jeff Keighley in the episode. They still send me collages and deep fake images like 20 a day. It's really quite a nuisance. Kojima later says, I have never spoken with Hassan. The game is yet to be released. I don't think there's much he can do or say at this point, but if he releases the game, people might understand, so maybe he should, he should just hurry up and release it. <laughs> and there you have it. If this speculation wasn't clear, cleared up for you before, it certainly must be now. I tell you, Paul, there, even though I had long passed this abandoned shenanigans after I went to my tirade, that for the first time like made our show explicit <laughs> in a way, but even though I like had to bleep all of that and you know the things that I wanted that that someone did to those developers. Uh, I do find it funny that it took this long for Kojima to finally do what I wanted him to do last year. To be like, come in and be like, hey, yo, not me. Yeah. That's the problem because he, he didn't just say anything. So the, it's what people say. When you construe the silence, you can sometimes take that maybe as a positive instead of a, instead of a negative. And, he, and also, let's not forget, Kojima has also been cheeky. Remember he when he started posting like um, music from his blue phone, um, talking about Silent Hill and the abandoned theme parks. So it was like there were it, it was very easy to like connect everything to the Sylvia way, and him being the one that has trolled us before. So yeah, Kojima is somebody that I have learned is somehow both the most in touch individual about technology and what can be possible and also extremely out of touch with everything else um of like him finding out about things that are like 20 years ago 10 years ago stuff that i've known about and he's like hey, i just found out about this thing the other day mm -hmm. and it's like 
really dude you didn't know about that so (laughs) it's like it's almost like he either heard about this and was like ah yeah i'm just gonna mess with the youngsters let's see what's going on and then everyone like took it way out of context and then he only found out about it after the fact and it was Mm -hmm. like oh i didn't realize that was a whole thing yeah all right whatever but he's like at this point where he's just so above everything else going on Mm -hmm. that it like doesn't really matter to him until it becomes like a nuisance as we've now seen yeah and i'm sure he knows plenty about it oh yeah (laughs) absolutely especially after he successfully quote unquote did a trolling campaign with the phantom pain so yeah i can imagine why at the nuisance of trying to see someone attempt to do what he did and do it so much worse. I can see him picturing it in the back. It's just like, I'm never freaking doing this again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, it, it to me, it was like, that will always be a cherished memory for me because it was like the gaming industry was take, took this by storm, remember? Like how everyone was like, a, we all went Pepe Silvia on this. I, in particular from us, was the one that really dove in. By the time when I saw the H and the the Hassan Karaman and like a weird uh, dialect translates in Google in Google Translate to Hideo Kojima. I was like, okay, that that's way too many. Con- this was the the point of way too many coincidences. But that night with that app, Paul, I will never forget it as long as I live. <laughs> uh, of me like constantly being there, I was ready. We were had recorded and be like, apparently the app is going live now, so we'll finally know what this is. We start recording episode fifteen. Then then I shut my lights off. I was like, I. Got close it up. I was like, okay, bring it over. And then it was like, no, keep checking soon. And, and again, and again, and again. And, again. and them saying, it would be like, no, we were having problems with the engine. And when they're like, no, because we're going to do a real time app for the trailer. And I was like, it's a trailer. You just launched the freaking trailer. It's like, oh, man. Great, great times. But staying with the Kojima news final story, Paul. Uh, Kojima rejects. Uh, let me see. Stupid ad block. Voice. Yeah, Kojima rejects ridiculously high acquisition offers to stay independent. Story by Michael Beckwith, Beckwith from Metro.com.uk. Uh, on his most recent podcast, the same podcast, Kojima admits he's received multiple acquisition offers and refutes rumors of his canceled state again. Given his close working relationship with Sony, there was speculation at one point that Hideo Kojima's studio, Kojima Productions, would be next in line to be absorbed into the company. Just to put in that, remember when they released that kind of like banners that had like the, the, the faces of every first party uh, character from recent exclusives on Sony that had PlayStation Studios logo? Yeah. Uh, there was one that released with Death Stranding in it. So everyone was like, oh my god, did they bought Kojima Productions? And that's when he was like, no, we're still independent. So, yeah, I remember now. Okay. So it continues, says, that didn't happen, though, with Kojima saying at the time that his studio will remain purely independent. More recently, he's not only reiterated, reiterated his pledge, but also revealed that he has routinely received ridiculously high offers to sell his studio, all of which he's rejected. Kojima doesn't name any specific companies, but this, can, but this does confirm that there aren't enough out there eager to bring Kojima and his team into their personal fold. However, Kojima states that he wants to only make games he's interested in making, something he'd likely be unable to do if another company like Sony or Microsoft was calling all the shots. Shots fired, I will say this as an editorial, because remember, Sony used to be the company that would allow every developer to do whatever game they, they, they wanted to make and they would fund it. That's what this training happened. So this is throwing shade at their longtime partner, I will say, that they have become more risk averse. And Microsoft is also not one where you see much creativity. Also, <laughs> there's there's just across the board. It's like, especially now with the cost consolidation mm-hmm. wars and the costs. Yeah. Um. It's just it's not a thing that you can afford to ignore as a possibility. Because imagine if somebody like Kojima goes to the competition, you're over almost. Um. Mm-hmm. I just imagine somebody has that much power to really sway directions. He's too high. Kojima's too powerful. <laughs> He's too powerful to be left alive. <laughs> yeah. So, c- continuing. Let me reiterate that we are in these. He said on the most recent episode of his Brain Structure podcast, we have no affiliations whatsoever, and we are not backed by anyone. And every day I am approached by offers all over the world to buy our studio. Some of those offers are in ridiculously high prices, but it's not that I it's, it's not that I want money. I want to make what I want to make. That's why I created this studio. So as long as I'm alive, I don't think I will ever accept those offers. It's, uh... 
It actually feels really good to hear someone be like, yeah, everything's consolidated, but we want our independence because anyone may want to like try to twist in knots and try to like do any mental gymnastic trying to justify this consolidation nastiness that we have through this whole year. But the truth is, is that sometimes when you're under a certain conglomerate, you will start seeing, they, they will start asking for numbers. They will start seeing that like the suits will eventually come in and they don't need that if they're independent. And I feel like um, if being independent is what gives us more weirdness, like that stranding. Well, Hell yeah, keep stay independent. I heard that Kojima's valuation is like 30 million. So he's definitely not like strapped for cash. Mm -hmm. So he's not a millionaire, but having 30 million, it's like you're like set. Like you're not like in, in wanting. And uh, he also like, I, I keep reiterating, uh, to me, it's also impressive that he made that stranding in three years at that level of quality he doesn't get enough credit for like being very efficient sometimes and how quick he, ca he can get a game going like like this new project the who am i who is yeah yeah uh, the where thing with I? yeah that where am i the thing with l fanning and things like yeah. that. so he's already got that project going so and the rumors are that we're probably gonna hear about it at, at keely's thing because he always shows up at keely's thing no matter what so so we'll see I'm glad that you're going to be independent, Kojima. Show everyone that not everyone needs to go under the the thralls of Daddy Microsoft that's going to throw $70 billion at your, sex, as, at your uh, sexually hara sexual harassment uh, dominated company because they want to put content on Game Pass. I so. just hope nothing ever comes out about Kojima or that he just mysteriously gets assassinated by one of these corporations. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that would be Those funny. are the only two options I, think I could see happening for yeah. Kojima. So before we go into the games that are coming out uh, for the next week, Paul, let's uh, a quick check in on our most anticipated list that are, I always keep here, adding the new, uh, adding a couple oh. entries into the Metacritic. Uh, All right. The Metacritic. So obviously we both had God of War Ragnarok as number one. So we have a, our, our number one, our game that has a 94 on both Metacritic and Open Critic. I also added to you the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 current Metacritic for the uh, for the most review has gotten on it's on PlayStation 5. It has a 78 on uh, Metacritic and 77 on on Open Critic. Slightly higher than Vanguard, but still that's lower end Call of Duty. Yeah, for sure. So, and uh, I added the Open Critic for Gotham Knights. We had we only had the 69 Metacritic it has a 70 on Open Critic. I feel that's actually accurate for that game. And for you, the Winter's Expansion, last week, one review had come, only a few reviews come, came out that had it at 67. More reviews came out that bumped it up to 74. Uh, open Critic and Metacritic, so. Yeah, I'd say 74 is probably pretty yeah. accurate for it. I mean, it's great for the 20 bucks you would spend on that, plus the third person perspective, plus whatever else it came with, I forget. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, the extra mercenary, uh, the mercenaries editions that you can play as. That's right, Lady, the, Lady the Matreska and Heisen, Heisenberg. A cool concept, like you get to really I w wreck Yes, out. but they're not unlocked immediately, so that kind of sucks. Okay, so you yeah. have to play mercenaries mm -hmm. to unlock them. After yeah, the I, pl game. I played a little of their, of mercenaries with Chris Redfield, and that's where I was reminded that I didn't like, I don't like the gunplay of that game because third person is not available in mercenaries. It's only in first person. Oh. So I noticed the difference of like, yeah, this doesn't feel as precise as when I'm in third person, which is weird. Yeah. So next week I will add uh, Sonic Frontiers. I have a feeling I screwed myself. <laughs> yeah, did you? I, I I don't know. There's something. I feel. Like I feel. The... Yeah, it's Sonic. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. So. However, I've been hearing only positive things that each time they come out with more details, mm -hmm. uh, more gameplay, hands-on stuff, people have been talking very highly about stuff that they've been seeing. Um, makes me curious about how it's going to go. It still doesn't want make me want to buy it, but mm -hmm. um, I, I want to one day be like, oh man, one day I'm going to finally buy this new Sonic game that came out. because Arrangement. It's I mean, I'm not going to do it for this, okay? I want to feel good about buying a Sonic okay, game. Okay, so just, right? let's just put it this way, Paul. What if it's actually really good? What if it has actually great reviews? Then we can one day buy it yeah. a little later on. Because, I mean, I'm not going to do it the day before God. I know. It, that, that's to me like the funniest thing that they... It, it was so funny that they tweeted something about ready for the battle of the century today before the God of War Ragnarok reviews came out, so... 
don't know about that Sega. I know, yeah, it's like, even though they were the insistent that they're expecting this one to get great reviews, and remember Skill of making fun of them, he's like, yeah, that don't work like that, Chief. <laughs> you got game gotta be good. And he was the one that was very scathing with the E3 preview, but then that game has been looking more and more positive the more it's done, but it's like, it's the DCEU problems. Thing, all, things always look good, and then the reviews kind of... And then we enter the cycle, so... I wonder, I feel like I'm gonna get saved by Pentiment, because when I look at your list, uh, at, least, at least from the ones that were unique to you, like Winter's Expansion was the one that came in low, and then it it climbed up, because at the end we're gonna, like, tally it up and see who had, like, overall, like, picked everything and has good taste. <laughs> Even most of our games are the same. <laughs> yeah. So... I think a Pentiment's gonna rescue me if Sonic Frontiers doesn't. If nothing <laughs> else, um, gosh, I'm kind of curious if we're uh, we gotta we gotta add these up and average them out to see who has better taste mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Yes, and then we're gonna do the same whenever we do like our most anticipated one 2023 rolls around. Yeah. Kind of like how we, how we did at the beginning, but now like try to do more like fantasy football style, have more fun. So. Yeah. So, a game release is Paul for the week of... Let me see my calendar. For the week of Sunday, November 6th to November 12th. Write it down here. So, a little to the left comes to PC and Mac on November 8th. Football Manager 2023 comes to Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, Switch, and PC on November 8th. Oddworld Soulstorm comes to Switch on November 8th. Return to Monkey Island comes to PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S on November 8th. That was quick, because that, that was already out on Switch. Sifu comes out on November 8th on Switch. Uh, R.I.P. Joy-Cons. Play that game with a pro controller, people who are going to play it there. Uh, Sonic Frontiers, game of the year, comes, to, <laughs> comes out on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC on November 8th. God of War Ragnarok, this little game, uh, comes to PS5 and PS4 on November 9. Nice little indie title. Yeah. Uh, Vampire Survivors, an actually like highly praised recent indie game. Comes to Xbox Series X and S and Xbox One, also Game Pass on November 10th. Uh, Atari 50, uh, the anniversary celebration, comes to PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch and PC on November 11th. Resident Evil 2 comes to Switch on November 11th. Tactics Ogre Reborn comes to the PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, P Switch, and PC on November 11th. And Valkyrie Elysium comes to PC on November 11th. So, obviously, God of War. some good stuff for everybody, yeah. for sure. I mean, uh, and a Mo Return to Monkey Island, big mm -hmm. group of people, Sifu showing up on the screen. Not only that, uh, Return to Monkey Island is on Game Pass also, so big get for Xbox. Amen. Getting uh, that, yeah. Obviously, the the big obvious ones. Uh, don't sleep on the Atari Fifty. I have learned that anniversary celebrations of like old arcade games are huge mm -hmm. because that's exactly where I got a lot of my start was PC ports of old arcade games mm -hmm. for like the Midway titles. I like. Uh, oh, dude! I, there was the Midway Arcade Treasures games from PS2. That's the one. Yeah, I my dad bought those. I remember we were in New York and he saw both Collection One and Collection Two. And it was like I played these, and we we're buying them. They had Narc, yeah. they had Mortal oh, yeah. Kombat, they had a uh, Primal, they had a uh, Spy Hunter. Yep, Spy Total, Hunter, which Total is on Gotham Knights. Yeah, um, I don't, I'm sure you saw. Yeah, that. I played it a little bit. I was like, this is neat, and it makes sense because um, they, it, there was a part of WB games that used to be Midway. So Spy Hunter is under WB. Was one, I knew there had to be some kind of weird connection mm -hmm. to how, like, why is the whole game? for Spy Hunter in Gotham Knights. Remember so. DC Universe, uh, Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe? That was published by Midway, so. There it is, yep. And then, um, like, that would be uh, games kind of, like, absorb all of that. That's how they got NetherRealm. That so. makes perfect sense. And then the last one, of course, the Tactics Ogre Reborn. Nobody, none of y'all sleep on that, because apparently it's really good. Everyone, I, especially if you like yeah. Final Fantasy Tactics, Tactics yeah. Ogre is that. And... Coming out on November 11th, that's good for the... If God of War is not your thing, and I bet for some people it is. I know it's going to be it's going to be big. Uh, I know Sonic Frontiers at the very least can be like the spite game for the Xbox Switch and PC. People are don't get God of War and be like, well, we can play this. Granted, if it's good. But I tell you, this Vampire Survivors game, uh, again, like I mentioned, this, I mentioned him in the show, Gene Park. He absolutely, absolutely loves Vampire Survivors. That only came to PC. 
the fact that it's already gonna come out on X, uh, it was already on PC Game Pass. Now it's now on Xbox Game Pass. I'll definitely try it. That's a this is gonna be a really good month for Game Pass for me because next week is gonna be Pentiment. So, and that Paul concludes this week's episode. And now, uh, now you can rest. Now you can play some. Why are you gonna play now? Like as you. I'm gonna probably play a little bit of Modern Warfare 2 to unwind, and then maybe finish the night with uh, Gotham Knights. Yeah, try to finish Gotham Knights. At least try to try to push it through to the I end. I try to put a little bit in at a time, but also uh, we've been finally catching up on Andor, mm. and because um, we're like three episodes behind, so during that I want to play something where I don't have to think. And then after that's done, we put on something like New Girl or any yeah. of the other stuff that I can like focus on story games. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get into the God of War mood. I'm gonna be playing 2018 again, just as, as we lead into the, into nice. because I wanted to play Play, play Tale, and now I'm hearing that this game like yeah. Remember, we still have Play Tale there, and I, um, know. I, th I thought about it yesterday. I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot we have Play Tale Requiem. To deal with at the same time and it's like because of everything else going on it just got completely swept under the rug because that's like 100 percent plot for me mm -hmm. and like very little on the game that's part. been the problem because like there's been like they're like at least playing the call of duty multiplayer playing resident evil a little bit and uh and even gotham nice out those were more gameplay experiences and it, tiny kernels of narrative and gotham nice that caught my eye but play is more narrative and i'm kind of like not I need to I need to get into that mindset because but what God, I played of if we don't finish that before God of War comes out, it's over for Plague Tale. For uh, yeah, because it's for a while. I'm not going to be able to go back to it and review it clearly. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's like I'm going to be way too harsh on it because God of War is just going to do everything better. Mm -hmm. And despite all of the knowing is like differences in budget, it's just going to be like, eh, whatever. It's another story about mm -hmm. people doing things. Uh, I'll decide. I think because I'm, I'm like I'm done with many of the games that we bought. So at least recently, I still have to play a bunch of the early 2022 games. I don't know, even know if there's even gonna be time for me to finish that for like game of the year stuff. So I might I might force myself to play play till like I like it, but it's just I'm not in the mood. Yeah. Now I'm in the God of War mood. Now that we know what is coming, so mm -hmm. but we'll see. So Paul, where can people find you? As always, y'all can find me at Dork of Art on Twitter and also Dork of Art on YouTube, which is where I posted my recent yes. video <laughs> of a sick man panicking, mm -hmm. uh, trying to go through the mannequin segment of Shadows of Rose. So uh, you can find it there. I'm going to yeah. try to share it to Twitter. It was weird because it, it literally wouldn't let me post it. And it said, as long as you're playing like Resident Evil Village, we will not let you like post to uh, Twitter. Like it doesn't want you to see this video. That's so weird. I guess because but it was also a three videos. minute video. I wonder if it's in yeah. yeah, in Twitter. I think you can only cap it at like 30 seconds to one minute. I don't think you yeah, can make them that long. So there's got to be something, a reason. So I'll I'll just try to share it to my Twitter from YouTube. But now it's it's there for posterity's sake, at least. Uh, where can they find you? They can find me at a underscore Dorsegobi on Twitter, at Alejandro Segobi ninety three on Instagram, twitch.tv slash the Slayer Giant. When whenever we decide to finish Stranger of Paradise, I don't know when that will happen. <laughs> and. Uh, it's on the list, at least. Yes, I, I'm more positive about it after our playthrough of like the first twelve chapters of the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, my written content at thecriticalcorner.com, which yesterday I spent way too long scrounging every corner of that goddamn blog to find any dead link that could prevent me from monetizing. It has 40k hits. It's insane that that many people have found my blog with me not promoting much, but I was a uh, I, I tell you, if I'm able to like at least get AdSense going and I get something out of it, if it's actually getting that kind of traffic, I'm gonna feel more excited to like dive in and write more stuff. So, and I, I may finally finish that naughty little thing that I just abandoned. <laughs> so, oh well, but enough of that. Paul, was, this, this, this was fun. Thank you, Petco, for delaying this <laughs> this thing. And uh, everyone, stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your November. If you're a man, shave away your beard if you want and. Show us how big you can grow it. I don't participate in that because it would be unfair because mine grows so quick. And Paul's doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, That's why I keep it here. Yeah. Stay safe and remember. Press X. To play. Good night, everybody. Hasta luego.